Hi, my name is Margot Lecomte van Broek. I'm from Macquarie University in Sydney, and I'm going to present a paper titled You've Got This, a critical discourse analysis of toxic positivity as a discursive construct on an Australian public Facebook page. Okay, social networking services platforms have become a familiar way to connect with family, friends and acquaintances, often across geographical boundaries. Out of its total population of 26 million, Australia counts around 21 million frequent social media users. The most popular SNS platforms in Australia, as per the 1st of April 2021, are YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. The platforms are regularly frequented by individuals with invisible chronic conditions to connect with other individuals sharing the same issues in the hope of finding understanding and support and to obtain further information. However, the main purpose of a public Facebook page remains the dissemination of dominant discourse. And as Dahlberg remarks, this tends to turn the page into a site of interdiscursive contestation, where online discourses continuously compete for user attention. Several functional linguists have been exploring discursive exchanges in virtual communities, often based on appraisal theory, while adopting a systemic functional approach to multimodal discourse analysis. However, few studies have investigated the dialogical interaction that takes place on a public Facebook page, its possible effects on users, and any power imbalances that may persist. The present study critically analyzes part of the content of a public Australian Facebook page targeting individuals with endometriosis, their supporters, and researchers through a combination of systemic functional linguistics, pragma dialectics, and critical theory. The study reveals how the discursive construct of toxic positivity in a set of data retrieved using FacePager is underpinned by the neoliberal ideology of being in control of one's own body. It explores how the page represents individuals with endometriosis and their everyday reality, how the individuals themselves encode their experiences into language, and how participants exert power through the expression of ideational meanings. Finally, the argumentation behind the discourse employed by the page and its followers is critically evaluated by pointing out any fallacious moves made in reply to other followers' statements of distress. Toxic positivity constitutes a social media phenomenon that due to its widespread online usage and perceived negative impact on SNS users, merits further examination. The notion first appeared in Halberstam's work on the queer art of failure. However, Weinstein already explored the phenomenon of unrealistic optimism, of which toxic positivity may be considered a strong correlate. He discovered that individuals believed that they would never become the victim of any severe disease wrongly assuming that only others experience such suffering due to their own fault, as in their view, success happens to good people and failure is just a consequence of a bad attitude rather than structural conditions. Since individuals interacting with one another on SNS platforms inevitably compare themselves to their peers, the same illusion of invulnerability may arise, leading to unrealistic expectations of the future. And this may result in interpersonal conflict situations. The Australian public Facebook page under investigation was developed to raise awareness about endometriosis, a chronic inflammatory condition uh, associated with pelvic pain and infertility. It's a public Facebook page linked to a website providing further information. The organization behind the page was established in 2013. A total of 304 posts and 4,780 comments and replies on the fa Facebook page added between the 1st of January and the 31st of December 2020 
were retrieved via APA interrogation of the page through the use of FacePager. The posts were downloaded from FacePager and then the data was organized in separate CSV files according to the type of discourse. This should be seen as the first step in the analysis. All posts were labeled dominant discourse as they constituted discourse uttered by individuals in higher power positions. Any comments and replies were grouped together as participant discourse. Several comments and replies appear to contain false positive discourse um, since they demonstrated the use of overly positive, illogical and dismissive language. However, some po false positive discourse or toxic positive discourse was also found in the posts. Internalized false positive discourse was encountered as well as a result of an individual self-appropriation of the false positive discourse continuously encountered on SNS platforms. The use of affirmative discourse was also seen, especially in reply to any expressions of distress. And finally, some counter discourse was present as well. In the present study, SFL is integrated into a methodological framework that links language use with the concepts of power and ideology to illuminate any unequal power relations between SNS users and to uncover hidden ideologies that motivate false positive discourse. Within a social semiotic system, reality is a social construct, as uh, posited by Halliday arising from an exchange of meanings and stipulating what individuals should or should not do. Through the analysis of the participants' lexicogrammatical choices, the study aims to demonstrate how the page and its users construe themselves in terms of power and ideology. Hodge argues that both SFL and CDS take Halliday's social semiotic theory as their point of departure for discourse analysis. The totality of posts, comments and replies on the Facebook page further constitute a communicative act complex, aiming to elicit a response, turning the exchange into dialogue and the users into protagonists and antagonists. The resulting complex speech act has both illocutionary and perlocutionary effects, which are highly pertinent in the context of social media, since users are constantly asked to interpret posts or comments and to either accept or dismiss their impetus for action. Fragment Dialectics uh, takes the analysis one step further by reconstructing and evaluating the interactants' arguments based on logic reasoning. Uh, based on logical reasoning. Discourse is usually seen as a tool employed by individuals to share knowledge or to interact with others. Foucault moves beyond this narrow view by asserting that discourse is both an instrument and an effect of power. Similar to other societal symptoms, each Facebook page, page has its own regimes of truth, which are established through the use of discourse. As Foucault observes, truth is a thing of the world. Subsequently, any false positive discourse circulating on SNS platforms forces its users into adhering to the norms it represents, as such becoming a discursive strategy in itself. The Facebook page and its followers are represented as actors and receivers of actions. Material processes are favored by the page, as you can see here. A large number of the selected material processes represent actions which must be undertaken by individuals with endometriosis. A closer look at the Facebook page shows that it makes use of dominant discourse in its posts to invite followers to participate in research, raise funds, donate money to the organization, listen to podcasts, fill out surveys, and so on. From their selection of verbal processes, uh, it becomes clear that the page's administrators mainly use material processes, 55%. The large majority of these are transitive, with the pages, followers, or individuals with endometriosis being represented by the organization as most frequent actors. However, this large number of occurrences does not correlate with the followers' agency, since they are merely implied actors in command. The organization construes itself as an important actor, affecting various animate and inanimate goals. A large number of its activities occur in the context of research, such as collaborating with universities and research centers, 
processing applications for research funding or recruiting research participants. Some of its activities focus on raising funds for the organization, such as partnering with small businesses, organizing and promoting events or networking with influential women. The page mostly refers to itself using we in the actor position. From the sample, it is evident that whenever the page uses false positive discourse, it tends to mainly opt for relational identifying processes, 50%. This type of process involves token and value as its participants, both of which are nominal groups. The relational identifying process can be called the powerhouse of semiosis. And a few examples of false positive dominant discourse can be seen here on this slide. Any false positive discourse uttered by the page's followers shows the same grammatical patterns. Again, relational identifying processes are favored, 50%. And a few examples of forced positive participant discourse can be seen on this slide. The most selected process in affirmative participant discourse is also relational, 35%. However, unlike in forced positive discourse, it is attributive and merely describes a person or other entity. Since dominant discourse mainly consists of posts, any affirmative replies made by the page in reaction to its followers' comments are rare. When replying to other followers' statements of distress, followers express sympathy for the person's predicament through the use of relational attributive processes. And uh, here are a few examples. Based on the premise that all uh, contestative text is argument, all posts, comments, and replies on the page constitute a complex speech act exerting illocutionary and perlocutionary effects on the audience or the readers. The interlocutor's primary aim is for others to accept their claims, which may result in a difference of opinion. According to Pragma Dialectics, any dissensions may be resolved through a critical discussion as strategic maneuvering occurs. The validity of the interlocutor's arguments may be critically evaluated by reviewing the acceptability of their standpoints. Whenever interlocutors break the rules of a critical discussion, the argumentation will contain one or more fallacies. It's often assumed that false positive discourse is quite harmless since it is labeled positive. However, as the examples of fallacies in the interaction between interlocutors on the Facebook page show, false positive language use may have a negative impact on the well being of users doing the opposite of what it was meant to do. One common positive fallacious move is the use of words or phrases that discourage any further exchange of ideas or a thought terminating cliche fallacy. Um, other examples are uh, the appeal to pity and the ignoratio elenchi fallacy, as you can see there. The organization appears to recruit endo ambassadors to gather funds and raise awareness about endometriosis, but when their fame is used to influence the page's followers, the result may be an appeal to popularity fallacy. And uh, other examples are the red herring and the loaded question fallacy. It has become evident that the public Facebook page construes medical professionals as powerful agents of change, conducting research, diagnosing patients and performing surgery. Individuals with endometriosis, on the other hand, are construed as less powerful entities that simply follow what the organization and the page instruct them to do, such as participate in fundraisers and research, purchase things online, listen to podcasts, and manage their own minds and bodies. Both the organization and individuals with endometriosis are seen as actors acting upon concrete entities, such as the workplace, but also on inanimate abstract entities, such as courage. Whenever the Facebook page uses false positive discourse, it mainly opts for relational identifying processes stating its views on how individuals with endometriosis are supposed to think, behave, and act. 
based on a total of 1,247 clauses, 13% of the discourse employed by the page may be labeled as false positive, and the percentage is likely even higher among its followers. Organizations and medical professionals are increasingly making use of social media to enable individual self-management of their chronic conditions. In neoliberalism, however, the homo economicus is not a partner of exchange, as in the classical definition, but an entrepreneur of himself. He's someone who pursues his own interest and whose interest is such that it converges spontaneously with the interest of others, which echoes Smith's view that an individual is always seeking their own advantage and not necessarily that of society. The COVID-19 crisis has turned the healthcare sector into an industry, and as the result of artificial intelligence, big data, climate change, and the virus itself, has transformed Homo economicus into Homo preventicus. The discourse employed by some organizations and other powerful entities on SNS platforms seems to promote certain representations and both on and offline behaviors, which may alienate individuals who do not have the same resources. Some of the followers mirror the page's false positive discourse and identify individuals with endometriosis through the use of relational identifying processes in a similar attempt to influence their self-image and behavior. Individuals further tend to assume that negative events are less likely to happen to them than to others and that positive events are more likely to happen to them than to others. This type of unrealistic optimism is highly common on SNS platforms in general and even more so on Facebook pages, where faculty and discursive formations containing both images and text tend to flourish and support regimes of truth, determining what is acceptable and unacceptable in users' discourse. Some of the followers' strategic moves when uttering false positive discourse are fallacious as they dismiss or reduce other followers' statements of distress. Raingold already stressed that if we are to make good decisions as a society about a new, powerful communication medium, we must not fail to look at the human element. And language is a human element. Some scholars hold a rather optimistic view of SNSs. Shirky, for example, refers to them as places of collaboration, generating social change, and claims that easier and wider dissemination of information changes group awareness. This may be so in theory, though the harsh reality of everyday life often stands in stark contrast with any imaginary advantages, leading to further inequality rather than increased global homogeneity. Some of the followers appear to share the same ideological stance as the page or the administrators. Weinstein points out that if dominant followers consider what happened to another follower controllable, they will create a stereotypical image of that individual and assume that they were at risk because they failed to take any action to control the risk. The page's objective is for patients to be the CEOs of their own healthcare. The grammatical analysis demonstrated that even though Digital healthcare and patient empowerment may be highly commendable objectives, especially from the perspective of medical professionals, organizations, or the government. They may also exacerbate existing health inequalities. Therefore, we need more inclusive Facebook pages and more affirmative discourse among SNS users. Thank you very much. Bye.